Okay, welcome back everyone to theCUBE's coverage of Red Hat Summit 2021. Virtual, I'm John Furrier, host of theCUBE. Got two great guests here from AWS, Bob Wise, General Manager of Kubernetes for Amazon Web Services, and Peter Ulander, Head of Product Marketing for the Enterprise Developer and Open Source at AWS. Gentlemen, you guys are the core leaders in the AWS open source initiatives. Thanks for joining on, on theCUBE here for Red Hat Summit. Thanks for having us, John. Yeah, good to be here. So, you know, the innovation that's come from people building on top of the cloud has just been amazing. And, um, you know, you guys, props to Amazon Web Services for constantly adding more and raising the bar on more services every year. You guys do that. And now public cloud has become so, so popular and so um, important that now hybrid has pushed the edge. You got Outpost with Amazon, you see everyone following suit. It's pretty much a clear vote of confidence from the customers that hybrid is the operating model of the future. And that really is about the edge, right? So I um, want to chat with you about the open source intersection there. So let's get into it. So we're here at Red Hat Summit. So Red Hat's open source company um, and timing's great for them. Now part of IBM, you guys have had a relationship with Red Hat for some time. Can you tell us about the partnership and how it's working together? Yeah, absolutely. Why don't I take that one? Um, AWS and Red Hat have been strategic partners since Shoot, I think it's 2008 or so. Um, I, in the early days of AWS, when engaging with customers, we wanted to ensure that um, AWS was the best place for enterprises to run their Red Hat workloads. And this is super important when you think about, you know, what Red Hat has accomplished with RHEL in the enterprise. It's running SAP, it's running Oracle, so it's, it's running all different types of core business applications, as well as a lot of the, 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 the new things that, that customers are innovating in. So having that relationship to ensure that not only did it work on AWS, but it actually scaled. We had integration of services. We had, you know, the, the performance, the price, all of the things that were so critical to customers was critical from day one. And we continue to evolve this relationship over time as you see us coming into uh, Red Hat Summit this year. Well, to get into the hard news here, obviously the new service, Red Hat uh, OpenShift service on AWS, known as ROSA, the A for Amazon Red Hat OpenShift, A for Amazon Web Services, uh, clever acronym, but really it's on AWS. What exactly is this service? What does it do and who is it designed for? Well, I'll, let me jump in on this one. Um, maybe, maybe let's start with the why. You know, why, why, why Rosa? Uh, customers love using OpenShift, but they also want to use AWS. They want the best of both. So they want their peanut butter and their chocolate together in a single confection. And uh, uh, a lot of those customers have deployed AWS, uh, have deployed OpenShift on AWS. Um, they want a managed service, simplified supply chain. Um, they want to be able to streamline moving on-premises OpenShift workloads to AWS and naturally want good integration with AWS services. So as to the what, uh, it's uh, our new service uh, jointly operated and supported by Red Hat and AWS to provide a fully managed OpenShift on AWS. So again, like a lot of customers have been running uh, OpenShift on AWS before this time, but of course they were managing it themselves uh, typically and so now they get a fully managed uh, option with uh, also a simplified uh, supply chain. So single support channel, single billing. You know, we were talking before we came on camera about the uh, acronym on AWS and, you know, people build on the cloud. It's kind of like, it, it's no big deal to say that, but I know it means something. I want to explain, yeah. you guys to explain this on, because it's, it, I know I, I've been scolded for saying things on theCUBE that were kind of misspoken. Cause it's easy to say, oh yeah, I built that app. We, we built the, all the stuff on the cube is on AWS, but it's not on AWS. It means something from a designation standpoint. What does right. on AWS mean? Cause this is OpenShift service on AWS. We see this other companies have their products on AWS. This is specific right. designation. Can you share please? Yep. John, when you see the branding of um, something like Red Hat on AWS, what that basically signals to our customers is that this is, this is joint engineering work. This is, the top of the strategic partners um, where we actually do a lot of joint engineering and work to make sure that we're driving the right integrations and the right experience. Make sure that these things are accessible and discoverable in our console. Um, they're treated effectively as a first class service inside of, of uh, the AWS ecosystem. So it's, there's not many of the ons, if you will, you think about SAP on, 
um, VMware Cloud on AWS and now Red Hat uh, OpenShift on AWS. It really is that signal um, that helps give customers the, the confidence of you know, tested, tried, trued, supported, um, and validated service on top of uh, AWS. Um, and we think that's significantly better than anything else. It's, it's easy to run uh, a, 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 an image on a, on a VM and stuff it into, into a cloud service to make it available. Um, but customers want better. Customers want you know, tighter experiences. They want to be able to take advantage of all the great things that we have from a, from a scale availability and performance perspective. And that's really what we're, what we're pushing towards. Yeah, I've seen um, examples specifically where when partners work with Amazon at that level of joint engineering, deeper partnerships, the results are pretty significant on the on the business yep. side. So um, congratulations to you guys working with Op OpenShift and Red Hat, this real testament to their product. If I got to ask you guys, pull the Amazon uh, Amazon uh, playbook out and, and and challenge you guys or or just, you know, create uh, new, some commentary around the process of working backwards. Every time I talk to Andy Chassis, he always says, we work backwards from the customer and we get the requirements and we, we're listening to customers. Okay, great. He loves that. He loves to say that. It's true. I know that, but I've seen that at AWS. What does the customer work backwards document look like here? What, is the, what was the need uh, and what made this become such an important part of AWS? What was the, and then what are they saying now, now that the product's out there? Well, OpenShift has a very wide footprint, as does AWS, and uh, some some working backwards documents kind of write themselves because uh, the customer demand demand is so strong that there's just no avoiding it. And um, then it really just becomes about uh, making sure you have a good plan, so it becomes much more operational at that point. And uh, Rose is definitely one of those services. Uh, we had so much demand, and it's as a result. Uh, no surprise that we're getting a lot of enthusiasm for customers because so many of them asked us for it. Um, what's the response been so far? What's what, what's been the reaction? I'm asking demand. That's uh, I kind of got the sense of that. But okay, so there's demand. Now what? What's the what's the use cases? What are customers saying? What's the what's the reaction been? A lot of the use cases are are these um, hybrid kind of use cases where uh, customer has a big OpenShift footprint. Um, uh, what, what we see from a lot of these customers is a strong demand for consistency um, in order to reduce IT sprawl. What they really want to do is have the smallest number of simplest environments they can. And so the customers that standardize on OpenShift really want to be able to standardize um, OpenShift both in their on-premises environment and on AWS and uh, get managed service uh, options just to remove the uh, undifferentiated heavy lifting. Peter, what's your take on the um, product marketing side of this where, you know, you got um, open source becoming very enterprise specific and Red Hat's been there for a very long time. I've been, you know, user of Red Hat since the beginning and following them and Linux obviously is Linux where that's come from. But what features specifically jump out uh, in this offering that customers are resonating around? What's the, what's the vibe here? <laughs> And, and, and John, you kind of alluded to it um, early on, which is, uh, I don't know that I'd necessarily call it hybrid, but the reality is our customers have environments that are on premises in the cloud and all the way out, out to the edge. And today, when you think of a lot of solutions and services, it's a fractured experience that they have between those three locations. And one of our biggest commitments to our customers is to make things super simple, remove the complexity, do all of the hard work, which means, you know, customers are looking for a consistent experience environment and tooling that spans data center to cloud to edge. Um, and that's probably the biggest um, uh, kind of core asset here um, for, for customers who might've standardized on OpenShift in the data center as they come to the cloud, they, they want to continue to leverage those skills. I think probably one of the, um, a, an interesting one as we headed down in this past, we, we all know Delta Airlines, um, Delta is a great example of a customer who, joint customer, um, who have been doing stuff inside of AWS for a long time. They've been standardizing on, on Red Hat for a long time and bringing this together just gave them that simple extension to take their investment in Red Hat OpenShift um, and leverage their experience and, and again, the scale and performance of, of what a, AWS brings them. Next question, what's next for uh, Red Hat OpenShift on AWS? 
uh, in, in your work with Red Hat. What's, where does this go next? What's the big to-do item? What's, what do you guys see as the vision? I'm, I'm glad you mentioned uh, open source collaboration at, at the start there. Uh, one thing to point out is that uh, AWS works on the Kubernetes project upstream as does the Red Hat team. So one of the ways that we collaborate uh, with the Red Hat team is in open source. Um, one of those projects is a, a, a new project called ACK, um, uh, Amazon Controllers for Kubernetes. And this is a kind of Kubernetes friendly way for uh, customers to uh, use an API to manage AWS services. And um, so that's one of the things we're looking forward to uh, um, as that goes GA rolling out into both uh, Rosa and to our other services. Awesome, and I got, I got a, um ask you guys this while you're here because you know it's um, very rare to get two luminaries within AWS on the open source side. This has been a huge build out over the many, many years for AWS. Um, and some people really kind of don't understand um, kind of the position. So take a minute to clarify the position of AWS on open source. You guys are very active in the projects you mentioned upstream with Kubernetes in other areas. I've had many conversations with Adrian Cockroft on this as well as others within AWS huge uh, proponents, I mean, web services. I mean, you go back to the original Amazon. I mean, Jeff Barr was saying 15 years ago, some of those APIs are still in play here. You know, APIs back in you know, 15 years ago, that was kind of not, you know, mainstream at, the, at that time. So, you know, you had open standards really made Amazon web services successful and you guys are continuing it. But as the modern era is very enterprise-like and you see a lot of legacy, you're seeing a lot more operations that are going to be driven by open technologies that you guys are investing on. Take a minute to explain what AWS is doing and what you guys care about and your mission. Yeah, but why don't I start and then we'll kick it over to Bob because I think Bob can also talk about some of the key contribution sites. But the best way to think about it is kind of in, in three different pillars. So let's start with the first one, um, which is you know around the fact of, of ensuring that our customers' favorite open source projects run best on AWS. Since 2006, we've been helping our customers operationalize their open source investments and really kind of achieve that scale and focus more on how they use and innovate on the products versus how they set up and run. And, and for, for myself being an open source since the late 90s, the biggest opportunity yet challenge was the access to the technology, but it still required you as a customer to learn how to set up, configure, operationalize, support, and sustain. AWS removes that heavy lifting. And, and you know, again, back to that, that earlier point from the beginning of AWS, we help customers scale and implement their Apache services, their, 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 their database services, all of these different types of open source projects to make them really work exceptionally well on AWS. And, and back to that point, make sure that AWS was the best place for their open source projects. I think the second thing that we do and, and uh, you, you're seeing that today with what we're doing with Rosa and Red Hat is we partner with open source leaders um, from Red Hat to uh, Redis and Confluent to you know, a number of different players out there, Grafana and Prometheus, to even foundations like the LF and the CNCF. Um, we, we partner with these leaders to ensure that we're working together to grow, grow the overall experience and the overall, uh, the overall pie, if you will. And, and this kind of gets into that point you were making, John, in, in that, you, you know, the old world legacy proprietary stuff, there's a huge chance for refresh and new opportunity and rethinking or modernization, if you will, as you come into the cloud, having the expertise and the partnerships with these key players as, as enterprises move in is so crucial. And then the third piece I like to talk about uh, that's important to our open source strategies is really around contribution. We have a number of projects that we've delivered ourselves. I think the two most recent ones that really um, uh, you know, come top of mind for me is what we did with, with uh, Babelfish um, as well as with OpenSearch, right? So uh, contributing and driving in a true open source project that helps our customers um, you know, take advantage of things like an SQL, um, uh, a proprietary to open source SQL conversion tool, or um, you know what we're doing to make Elasticsearch um, uh, the the opportune or the or the the primary open platform for our customers. 
but we, you know, it's it's not just about those services. It's also collaborating with with key industry initiatives, and you know, Bob's at the forefront of that with what we're doing with the CNCF around things like Kubernetes and and Prometheus, et cetera. Bob, you wanna you wanna jump in on some of that? Sure. Uh, I think the 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 one thing I would add here is that. Um, Customers love using these open source projects, but one of the challenges with them frequently is security. And this is job zero at AWS. So a lot of the collaboration work we do, a lot of the work that we do on the upstream projects is um, uh, kind of specifically around kind of security oriented things because that is what customers expect when they come to get a managed service at AWS. So um, some of those efforts um, are, are somewhat unsung because um, you generally do more work and less talk um, in security oriented things, but uh, in projects across AWS, that's that's always a key contribution focus for us. That's off. Awesome. Good way to call out um, security too. I think that's being built into the everything now. That's on operating model. People call it shift left, day two operations, however you want to look at it. You got this nice formation going between under the hood kind of programmability of the infrastructure at scale. And then you have the modern application development, which is just again, programmable DevSecOps. It's funny, um, Bob, I'd love to get your take on this because you know, we, and I remember in the eighties and during the Unix generation, I used to <laughs> pedal software under the table, like, hey, here's a copy of Unix, don't tell anyone. You know, people in the younger generation don't get the fact that it wasn't op always open. Okay, and so now you have open and you have this idea of an enterprise that's going to be a system management system view. So it's, you got engineering and you got computer science kind of coming together. This SRE middle layer, you're hearing that as kind of a new discipline. So DevOps kind of has won. I mean, we kind of knew this for many, many years. I said this in 2013 on theCUBE actually at reInvent. I, I just recently shared that clip, but okay, now you got SecOps, DevSecOps. So now you have an era where it's a system thinking and open source is driving all that. So can you share your perspective because this is kind of where the puck is going. It's an open open to open world. It's going to have to be open and scalable. How does open source and you guys take it to the next level to give that same scale and reliability? What's your vision? You know, the, the, the key here is really around automation and what we're seeing, um, you could look at Kubernetes. Kubernetes is essentially a robot. It was like the early design of it was built around robotics principles. So it's a giant software robot and uh, the world the world has changed. Um, if you just look at, um, you know, the, the um, influx of all kinds of automation uh, to not just the DevOps world, but to all industries, you see a, a similar kind of trend. And so the, the, the world of a IT operations person is changing from doing the work that the robot did and replacing it with a robot to managing large numbers of robots. And in this case, the robots are like a little early and a little hard to talk to. And so, you know, you end up using languages like YAML and other things. Um, but it turns out robots still just do what you tell them to do. Um, and so uh, one of the things you have to do is be really, really careful because um, robots will go and do whatever it is you ask them to do. On the other hand, they're really, really good at doing that. So. Um, you know, in the security area, there, the, you know, I think the research points to the largest single source of security issues being people making manual mistakes. Yeah. Um, and, um, you know, a lot of people are still a little bit terrified if human beings aren't touching things on the way to production. Um, AWS, we're, we're terrified if humans are touching it. Um, yeah. And that is a super hard chasm to cross. And, um, Open source projects are really play, are really playing a, a big role in what's really a IT wide uh, migration to a whole new set of not just tools but organizational approaches. Peter, what's your yeah, reaction yeah. to that? Because we're talking we're talking essentially software concepts. Because if you write bad code, the code will execute what you did. So assuming it compiles like in the old days. Now, if you're going to scale large scale operations that has dynamic capabilities, services being initiated, and terminating, tear down, up uh, started. You need the automation, but if you really don't design it right, you could be screwed. Right. This is a huge the, deal. The, this is one reason why we've put so much effort into a GitOps. Um, it's a, you can think of it as a more narrowly defined subset of the DevOps world with a specific set of principles around using kind of simplified declarative approaches along with robots that converge the desired state, converge the system to the desired state. Um, and when you get into large distributed systems, you end up needing to take those kinds of approaches 
to get it to work at scale. Uh, uh, otherwise, you have problems. Yeah, yeah. just adding to that, I, I, and it's it's funny you said you, you know DevOps is one. I actually think DevOps is one, but DevOps hasn't changed as as the, the <laughs> cloud move, right? You know, the reality is it was founded back what uh, quite a while ago. It was more around CI/CD in the enterprise and the closed data center, and it, and it it was one of those where automation and runbooks took uh, addressed the fact that you know every pair of hands between service requests and service delivery created you know created an issue. So that that growth and that that mental model of moving from you know uh, waterfall agile to DevOps, you you built it, you run it type of a model, I think is really really important. But as it comes out into the cloud, you know you no longer have those controls of the data center, and you actually have infinite scale. So back to your point of you you got to get this right. Um, you have to architect correctly. You have to make sure that your code is good. You have to make sure that you have full visibility. This is where it gets really interesting at AWS and some of the things that we're, we're tying in. So whether we're talking about GitOps, like what Bob just went through or what you brought up with DevSecOps, you also have things like AIOps, right? And so looking at how we take our uh, machine learning tools to really implement um, the appropriate types of code reviews to, to uh, uh, assessing your infrastructure or your your, your choices against well-architected principles and providing automated remediation is key. Yeah. Adding to that is observability. Developers, especially in a highly distributed environment, need to have better understanding, fidelity, and touch points of what's going on with their application as it runs in production. And so what we do with uh, regards to uh, the work we have in observability around the um, um, Grafana and, and Prometheus projects only accelerate that co whole concept of continuous monitoring and continuous observability. And then kind of, you know, re really, uh, uh, you know, adding to that, I think uh, it was it was last month we we introduced our fault injection simulator, a chaos engineering tool that, again, takes advantage of all of this automation and and um, machine learning to really help our developers, our customers operate at scale, right, and make sure that when they are releasing code, they're releasing code that is not just great in a small sense, it works on my laptop, but it's it works great in a highly distributed, massively scaled environment around the globe. You know, this is one of the things that impresses me about Red Hat this year, and I've said this before on other uh, covers, events I've covered with them, is that they get the cloud scale piece, and I think their relationship with you guys shows that. And I think, you know, DevOps is one, but it's the gift that keeps giving in open source because what you have here is no longer a conversation about the cloud, moving to the cloud, it's the cloud has become the operating model. So the conversation shifts to much more complicated enterprise or, and or intelligent edge and whether it's industrial or human or whatever, you know, you've got a data problem. So that's, it's about a programmability issue <laughs> at scale. So, you know, what's interesting is that Red Hat is on this bandwagon, it's an operating system. I mean, basically it's a distributed computing paradigm, essentially a la AWS concept as a cloud now goes to the edge it's just distributed services via an open open source. So what's yeah, your reaction it, to that? that yeah, it, it's, it's back to the original point, John, where I said, you know, any, any CIO is thinking about their IT environment from data center to cloud to edge and the more consistency automation and, and you know, um, kind of tools that they're at their disposal to enable them to create that, that um, uh, uh, kind of, you know, I, I think you, you started to talk about it, infrastructure, the whole as code, infrastructure is code. It's it's now almost everything is code. Um, and, you, you know, that starts with the operating system, obviously. Um, and and that's why this is so critical that we're, we're partnering with companies like Red Hat on 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 our vision and their vision because they, they align to where our customers are ultimately going. Bob, you want to you want to add to that? No, I think you said it. I think you said it all well. <laughs> you guys are crushing it. Bob, one quick question for you while I got you here. You mentioned GitOps. I've heard this before. I kind of understand. Can you just quickly define from your perspective, what is GitOps? Sure. Um, well, GitOps is really taking the, like I said before, it's a kind of narrowed version of DevOps. Sure, it's infrastructure as code. Um, you know, sure, you're doing things incrementally. Um, but the, the GitOps principle, it, it's back to like, what are the good, what are the best practices when you're managing large numbers, large numbers of robots? And in this case, it's it's around this idea of declarative intent. So 
instead of having systems that reach into production and change things, what you do is you set up the de defined declared state of the system that you want and then leave the robots to um, constantly work to converge the state there. That seems kind of nebulous. Let me give you a, like a really concrete example from Kubernetes. By the way, the entire Kubernetes system design is based on this. You say, um, I want uh, five pods running in production and that's running my, my application. So what, what Kubernetes does is it sits there and it constantly checks, oh, I'm supposed to have five pods. Do I have five pods? Do I have five pods? Well, what happens if the machine running one of those pods goes away? Now suddenly it goes and checks and says, oh, I'm, I'm supposed to have five pods, but there's four pods. What action do I take to now try to get the system back to the state? So you don't have a system run it, reaching out and checking um, externally to Kubernetes. You let Kubernetes do the heavy lifting there. And so um, it goes through, a, goes through a loop of, oh, I need to start a new pod. And then it converges the system state back to running five pods. So it's really taking that kind of declarative intent uh, combined with constant convergence loops uh, uh, to uh, fully fully production at scale. That's awesome. Well, we have, we do a whole segment on state and stateless uh, future, uh, but we don't have time. I do want to summarize real quick. We're here at the Red Hat Summit 2021. You got um, Red Hat OpenShift on AWS, the big news. Bob and Peter, tell us quickly uh, in summary, uh, why AWS, why Red Hat, why better together? Give the quick uh, overview. Bob, we'll start with you. Bob, you want to kick us off? Uh, I'm I'm going to repeat I'm going to repeat peanut butter and chocolate. Uh, <laughs> the customers love OpenShift. They love managed services. Um, they want uh, uh, simplified uh, simplified operations, simplified supply chain. Um, so you get you get the best of both worlds. You get the uh, OpenShift uh, OpenShift that you want, fully managed on AWS, where you get all of the security and scale. Yeah, I, I can't add much to that other than saying, you, you know, Red Hat is a powerhouse obviously on, on uh, data centers. It is it is the operating system of the data center and, you know, bringing together the best in the cloud with the best in the data center is such a huge benefit to our customers because back to your point, John, our customers are thinking about what are they doing from data center to cloud to edge and, and, and bringing the best of those pieces together in a seamless solution is so, so critical. Um, and that, that's why AWS. Guys, great, for, thanks for coming on. I really appreciate it. I just want to give you guys a plug for you and you, you know, being humble, but you know, working the CNCF and standards bodies has been well, well known and um, getting the word out. Congratulations for the commitment to open source. Really appreciate the community. Thanks you, thank you for your time. Thanks John. Thank okay, you. CUBE coverage here, covering Red Hat Summit 2021. I'm John Furrier, host of theCUBE. Thanks for watching.